Welcome to another episode of Behind the Pixel. I'm your host, Joe. One of my favorite authors on the subject of race is Tim Wise. Recently, he wrote about how tweeting, reading, and even protesting is not enough in the fight for equality, and that sustaining white anti-racism requires real cross-racial connection and relationships. He wrote about many of his earlier experiences that have led him on the path to becoming the man he is today, saying, Many years ago, my mentors at the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond asked me why I cared about undoing racism in America, since, as a white man, I didn't have to. I could easily go about my life indifferent to inequity and accepting of systemic white supremacy as most of us have been for many a century. At the time, figuring it best to offer some deep philosophical answer to the question, I did the whitest thing one could. I offered some MLK quote about injustice anywhere being a threat to justice everywhere. In response, I was informed that my movement literacy was high, but that I might want to come up with a more original answer, and more to the point, a more truthful one. Because as it was explained to me, my interest in the subject had nothing to do with Dr. King. It was here that Tim began to realize it was the relationships that we make not the philosophical ideals we strive to attain as a society. That is what keeps us dedicated to the cause of equality and anti-racism. Our involvement in different communities is what keeps us engaged and emotionally attached to and empathetic with those around us. There seems to be a natural progression that many white suburban millennials like myself have experienced in regards to race. When you're younger, we are taught by our parents and other authority figures that you need to treat everyone equally, that the color of your skin or their skin does not matter. It's the preschool version of MLK quotes. When you get older, our elders seem to loosen up and start to show us how they feel. Their view on skin color wasn't as clear cut as it is now. Instead, it becomes, you don't want to judge people based on their skin, but Sometimes stereotypes are true. And when you're seen as an adult, their prejudices begin to show and they say things like, all we do is give them money. They need to start helping themselves. Nobody helped me. Through the years, hopefully some of those relationships stick, whether they are friendships, partners, or even colleagues. Those relationships force us to face the difficult reality of what past generations believe and what we have experienced. They raised us to reach out at a young age, and now that we have an adult generation that is more educated, more socially and racially concerned, a divide is being forged. This divide is not new and has been going on for decades, but now, due to social media, we are more acutely aware of disparities, but also able to maintain these relationships that gave us this foundation. And now past generations that chose to remain blissfully unaware are pushing back because we understand that things need to change. When I was asked to start this podcast, I wanted it to matter. And I wanted it to be about art and the issues and ideas artists were exploring in their work. When Latabo and I spoke, I went right to the heart of what I wanted to discuss with her. It was the only thing I was familiar with in regards to South Africa, race relations. Are you familiar with Trevor Noah? Yeah, yeah. A lot of his stories deal with apartheid in the 90s. And he talks about having to lie about his mother, who was black, and having to tell police officers that she was just a maid who worked for them. Is that an accurate representation of South Africa? Um, not for me no because like i'm a i'm a born free like i i wasn't born in the party times so um things were a bit different in terms of just um the level of uh racism obviously still there in general but like right like obviously right now like we can go to like specific schools that weren't black kids weren't allowed to go to we can now stay in certain areas that black uh, people weren't allowed to back then. So I'd only say that's like the only difference between my story and his. But other than that, 
um it's the same you know everything is still more or less the same it's just that um things are a bit more subtle and discreet in that sense but in general it's okay <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to uh, <laughs> mince words that's um i think that's um a very polite way of saying that um you know things are still shitty like yeah no definitely like things are still <laughs> shitty but at least <laughs> right now like you'll get in trouble for it you know you can't like openly be racist you know at least now you can see it on maybe like the way people treat you but then it's never like really like out there in your face you know because right um, yeah their laws and stuff like that now to you know to sort of stop that but other than that it's still the same especially like in Pretoria there's a lot of well in the area that I live in there's a lot of um there are very few people of color here there's very few black people where I live so um so you can imagine how it is going to the shops sometimes or going to the hospital and it's just like what are you doing here oh, <laughs> you know you get those those what are you doing here? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. What are, <laughs> I'm sorry, but what are you doing here? Because, like, especially at some place like a hospital, like, and I don't know if it's the same, like, uh, medical laws there that we have here, but, like, the first, like, Hippocratic Oath that doctors take is first do no harm. And if, like, you're responsible for treating someone in a hospital, like, your preconceived notions and prejudice like they have to be completely left at the door like i don't know how you go into that field and not empathize or sympathize with people of any creed or race or whatever like that baffles me. yeah that's i think that's the the most the, that's the most scariest thing about it really it really is i think it's not just with like um hospitals but also like in schools like at least right now like in varsity a lot of varsity is um, when you do write like your finals, you don't have to write your name and surname, which helps. You just write your student number so that you're not judged based on your surname, your African surname or your African name and so forth. But it's said that those kinds of things have to be, those kinds of measures have to be put in place and so forth so that there's no bias and stuff like that. But that seems a little more progressive than it is here <laughs> um, in some ways because we still um, ask questions about race and um, names. But, you know, the, I guess, trade off is that, like, we're supposed to be um, doing, um, what's it called? Um, affirmative action based on that stuff. But I don't know. I think it's better the way it's done there. Like, so it's just like, a person on a piece of paper and you don't know anything about them and you just like can be objective yeah and that it really really helps and i think um but i think like it also just depends like obviously where you are like which city you are in uh in south africa you know like there's also some cities where it's really really racist like uh, my boyfriend was telling me that at his varsity um kids still get taught in afrikaans right so you have english and afrikaans those are the two languages you get taught in so like um the privilege that comes with being taught in your home language you know so like afrikaans is the language that majority of white people speak here in south africa so it just instantly becomes unfair you know like why can't we be taught in our own like home language in zulu Tswana, and so forth so yeah but it's normalized it's it's normalized it's normalized it's quite weird I imagine. Do you have? Um, I mean, you can't see me, but I assume you've possibly seen my Instagram profile picture. I'm a regular, you know, white bread guy, and um, like, I grew up in a family that, I guess, is kind of like what you were talking about. How it's subtle and um, kind of like hidden that racist belief and. Um, and maybe it's also like um, ignorance too, because like I grew up with my family saying that like, oh well, nobody helped us out and stuff like that. But like, um, they don't see how like just being normalized into like white culture uh, benefited us. 
Um, do you have like white friends there? Do you have people that um, you feel comfortable talking about race with there? Um, yeah, like I do. I don't have white friends, but um, okay. I do have friends who have white friends. Um, but yeah, like we freely talk about it. Uh, it it's very. Um, it's very important to sort of, I feel, maybe like stick around people you feel like you can trust. But I think, yeah, I think the friends that my friends do have, I feel like they can trust them. And we do have um, open discussions about like race now and again, because it can get depressing. <laughs> but, <Right. laughs> yeah, we, we do speak about it freely. Yeah. Hmm. Um, is there, do you have a way to like, like, how do you figure out? who you can trust to discuss those things. Like, I try to, especially with all my black friends and um, when I'm working with black people, I try to overtly showcase what my beliefs are on race and stuff so they do feel comfortable. Like, you and I don't know each other, but I jumped right into it in hopes that you would feel like you could trust me. Yeah, I think I think mainly it's usually... Um, it's usually them bringing it up. I think it's very difficult to be like part of, if you're the one being hurt, it's difficult to, you know, constantly mention it, you know, be like this, 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 especially because, especially if it's to someone who is white, you know, who's from a race where, you know, they, they hurt you, you know what I mean? But usually just keep quiet and usually they will mention it and then you're like, oh, okay. This one's cool. But I think also you also just see it with, I don't know, <laughs> racist people can't hide that they're racist. So you'll just see it in like the way they look at you. They'll they don't want to be near you. They'll keep the conversation short and sweet. So you'll you'll get the message and we'll be like, okay, this person doesn't really like me. I get it. Let me move forward. But yeah, also just subtleties. You can just tell. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Um because I do think I can tell a little bit. Um, I don't know that I've been looking for it my whole life. Like, you know, like I grew up surrounded by that ignorance. So it was just like, oh, yeah, like everyone's pretty much treated equal. Like everyone's given a fair shot. And really, that's not the case at all, even slightly. Um, I do think it's gotten better um, here in the sense that difficult conversations are being force upon especially like my republican right-leaning family um it's not easy at all and um they've kind of shut me out because like there's a line drawn in the sand now um do you think like i mean obviously like again i don't know what you know about the states and such but like it seems like a lot of people are having conversations like this like you say it's the same still but do you have hope now because of the last year like when during the summer we had all of our protests here like did you start to see more people come out in defense or yeah um, i think i've seen an improvement in terms of just um expressing ourselves and like really um normalizing having those kinds of conversations especially like on social media and like the younger generation i feel like um, they're more vocal, and I feel like that will help a lot. Because if you look at a lot of the older generation, they're more conservative, you know. Even if they can see that this is wrong, you know, we were not treated fairly, like, they'd rather just keep quiet about it. But this generation is more like, no, let's talk about it. That's wrong because, you know. So I think social media really ha is going to have a has and will have a bigger um, impact on um, just expressing our views in terms of race, like openly expressing our views in terms of race. Yeah. I do have that hope with social media too, but part of me worries that um, we have those conversations online rather than in person. Um, so like, that's my fear, but like also like it's, these conversations are difficult, especially to have with family members that, grew up and don't feel like changing now, you know? So like, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe it is still good. Now, in regards to your art, do you feel like you have to kind of hold back when you're expressing yourself through your art? Um, at first I did. 
and that's what my art sucked. <laughs> but um, I think, but also it was just a reflection of the kind of person I was at that time and a reflection of like, I'm a very in- introverted person. Like I, I really like express myself. So I think hmm. the, the little bit of expression I did um, do was like with my art, you know, but like it was only like a certain, I only shared a certain amount um, of myself through my work. And I think the more I created, the more I could say confident I felt. And I think it reflected in my work. But right now, I'm at a space where I don't feel shy about sharing um, any um, views about myself, but about like what I, views about anything about life. But I think it took a lot of time. It really did take a lot of time. And, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm here. Because I feel like my work just looks better and it's it's raw. It, it's, it has that kind of rawness that I've always wanted it to have. So, yeah. How long have you been doing NFTs and been on Super Rare? Um, I actually joined in December. And, um, oh. <laughs> yeah, but like um, I knew about it like I'd say maybe two months before. The first month was just me literally just doing research just a whole bunch of research watching videos trying to just like figure out what it is like if i'm not missing anything and so forth and then after that that's when i applied um on super and then that kind of like took a month and then yeah that's when i started minting my work and so forth but yeah was that like kind of like a moment for you when you felt like oh someone else is believing in me so now i don't have to hold back or was that earlier in your work that was way earlier like with work i sort of have with the work i have on super a i had already created like a long time ago so it was just like me tokenizing the work but it was way longer way earlier i think nfts for me were just um were a space for well for me i think it's a different how do i put this um for one reason i'd say that um i looked at nfts as a space where um we are now put at the same level as traditional artists in terms of how our work is appreciated and also valued financially you know i think with us digital artists we subconsciously let that belief that digital art is not real get to us you know <laughs> so like you see it in like how um how how shy um our pricing is when it comes to prints and stuff like that you know you can see like it's like oh ten dollars for that like that should be more you know what i mean so i think it, we let it get to us and i feel like nfts have provided like a safe space where we sort of feel um accepted finally <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. And I think uh, with digital art, um, I think how I think a lot of people, because of cell phones and softwares and so forth, people always feel like digital art is easy, like you said, until they try it out. And I feel like it, it's not, you know, because we're still like using our own ideas. We're still using our own efforts. And like digital art is um how can i put this um has its own pros and cons people when people look at digital art they just think it's just gonna it's just easy you know everything is easy all the tools are here for you but because you can do like anything you want almost exactly you know and there's they also like disadvantages with using um a tablet or a computer to um create but because like there's that uh thing where people undermine it they don't get to sort of like give it room to actually um, sort of release everything about itself, if I can put it that way. But yeah, it's an art form. I think it's still relatively new. And I feel like maybe that's why um, people don't like it or fear it, if I can put it that way. But I think it will become more normalized, especially because of the younger generation. Like younger kids are always playing games on their tablets. So you can imagine like they're always on phones and so forth. So creating digitally will be something that they will start exploring rather than creating traditionally. 
that'll take time but yeah and by then like i mean i'm looking at super rare um and looking at what people are list relisting your work for and it's already like in the hundred thousands eighty thousand dollars like i mean that's how yeah it could be exciting if that person gets that amount of money and you could have that but that's also someone saying like I don't want to part with this for any less than this dollar amount. That's how precious your work is. Yeah. I imagine you have other artist friends. Do you have friends that are still like hesitant about getting into NFTs? It's bizarre to me that I see other artists in this field saying like, no, I would never do that. This is awful for the environment. Um, not, not friends, but I do know of artists that are like, hell no. You're killing the environment. <laughs> it's a pyramid scheme. Right. How could you do this? OMG, I don't trust this. And I feel like it's just because of lack of understanding about what NFTs really are. And also because <laughs> I don't know what it is about this digital age, but people always feel rushed into getting into something. Just because something is trending doesn't mean you have to jump onto it. Like, And I feel like that's where a lot of the hate is coming from because people... I don't know where they get this pressure from, but people feel like, no, I should be in the NFT space. No, you don't have to. You don't have to do it right now. Like, take your time, do research until you understand it. So, yeah, I think that's also another thing. I don't know where it's coming from, but yeah. The pyramid scheme argument <laughs> is funny. Like, physical art is also set up the same exact way it's set up in the NFT world, except artists aren't getting paid each time something sold. So if that's what's keeping you out, like you got to find another argument. Then, <laughs> and, um, but the what you said about um, that um, almost like hate of or hesitancy to get in because it's um, all this excitement around it. And it's like, oh, I got to do that now too. Um, I never considered that, um, but there is that level of just you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, yeah. That this trend is not going to last. Um, and then they're going to be right back where they started. Um, because it's, you know, it's already hard enough to make a living as an artist. But there is an upfront cost to listing your work and applying for things. And I know it's exhausting. And then you have to possibly wait a month for a sale. Um, now, it's March, well, it's almost April now. How long did you have to wait for your first sale? Like, did you get, like, immediate um, uh, positive feedback, like, from when you listed? Or did you have to, like, wait and go through that period of, oh, no, did I make a mistake here? Um, I, I think I was lucky enough to, I didn't wait that long, actually. Mm. I got, I got, I think I got my first bit, like, two days later or something. Ooh. A day or two days later, but... Um, I think it's also because like I had decided I was I think I was strategic about it like I minted my most popular piece like that I felt like a lot of people will just instantly be drawn to it like aesthetically and yeah but I was lucky enough to not have waited but I know a lot of artists who do wait a very long time and then obviously you start getting desperate more than anything and mm -hmm. scared you start like promoting your work under collector's tweets and stuff and it looks so <laughs> awkward and all of that stuff and it's simply because you also want to be part of the artists that like make sales and you don't want to be overlooked because at the end of the day it's still your work mm -hmm. and it's precious you're right um it is precious like you guys are putting yourself into that and all the money does is allows you to not have to sacrifice or concede any of your values to your work that's all it's doing it's just like here's more money go make more of this you know you have an idea go do it and it's i don't know i think that's how people need to start looking at it but yeah how do you balance that fear of like oh no someone's not going to see this because right now super rare seems to be the only platform that's really curating artists like, we don't have anyone out there right now 
trying to say like, oh, this artist is good. This is who you should be. Right now, it's just a free for all and people are being ignored. It doesn't help that there's like this, this space is growing exponentially. So there's always like five, 10 new artists in the scene every single week. But I think it's also just to, I think what I always remind myself is that my work is unique. Like there's nothing like this. Like I think there's no way somebody can recreate something like this. And I just keep the faith. I really just, just put it out there. And I feel like I was lucky in a sense that one of my first, my earliest um, pieces were like bought. So that kind that money is still keeping me like afloat and I can Mm. then like just relax when I mint new pieces. And I know it's a bit difficult for other um, artists who are unable to sell their pieces, but also I think if you really believe in your art, somebody is bound to grab it. And I think also people must not must remember that like collectors and investors are people and they're just not they're not bots, you know, you don't just put your work and then you get a bit and you get the money and so forth. Like they're people, you know, like they need time. And I realized that a lot of collectors like are watchers in a sense that They'll like your work, they'll follow you, but they won't start buying your work now. They'll give you like a month or two to see how invested you are in the community. If you do have like um, value or potential and so forth. And then that's when they'll decide to bid on your work. So I think don't even, I feel like the first three pieces that you tokenize, just forget them. Tokenize, tokenize some more. (laughs) And then, because I feel like collectors do want to trust you and feel like, you know, feel like you won't like disappear after you sell your first piece and so forth. So, yeah, I feel like the first three pieces just, yeah, forget about them. Just they'll probably take time to sell. Maybe after the fourth one, a collector will be like, hey, who's this person? You know, let me grab all four of them. Great work. You know what I mean? I've never, um, I've never considered the, uh, collector being a person too in yeah. the equation <laughs> like and that's basically my role in it too because like i do buy art and but like i'm still on the side of you know wanting to advocate for artists and still wanting still kind of like in awe of all of your talent um so like i never stopped to think like oh right i have human emotions too when i'm buying things but you're right like it does um and i think part of it um is it's just your artwork is just on the screen right now and you get a little Mm. snippet to explain um what your work is but again since it's so new there's nothing out there right now where i mean this podcast is a start but this is still relatively new too but you guys don't have a platform to discuss ideas and really tell your story because that's part of it too. And that's what draws me to artists as well. Your story and the fact that you're in South Africa, like that adds a whole nother layer to your work. Like you are representing uh, black women um, in your work and it's beautiful, but knowing you're in South Africa and you've had a complete completely different experience with race just adds so much more to your work and increases the value exponentially because of it. Yeah, but yeah, I think it's also important for like new artists starting off to like engage with like the community because sometimes it's your work is great, but not a lot of people saw it. Literally, that's all. And I think it's important for artists to also remember that you even though like you might be like really popular on Instagram and Twitter in the NFT space, if you're a newbie, you're a newbie. You know, it's a totally different space. And I think like just constantly obviously like don't be weird about it <laughs> and like promote your stuff under people's streets when they don't ask for it. But like just like uh engage with the community, like talk to connect with other artists, um, check out their work, help them promote their work. Um, join Discord channels, Telegram groups, and you know, just like explore the space. And like that's where you'll find collectors, you know. And just yeah, just be yourself and have that unique thing about you. Yeah. Yeah, we're all looking for 
like one community because like you, you just listed three spots twitter telegram and discord and we're scattered all over the place we need a central hub where we all just go and to talk to each other <laughs> still it's like the internet is and decentralization of cryptocurrency in general has done a good thing of kind of giving the power back to individuals in a sense but we're all still so separated that like none of us are lining up mm, that's true that's true i think it's also because the space is relatively new like we're we're learning as we go hey everything is just you know new things are like popping up on the scene and we're just trying to figure out how to deal with that how to deal with that i think also these platforms are that way so yeah i think it's just learning literally learning on the go and also like networking i think networking is the name of the game you know yeah i think you're absolutely right have you thought about doing collaborations with other artists because that is networking for artists it's all right let's work on something together yeah definitely like um right now i am working on something um i think it's gonna be released run about on this like on the 6th of april with nifty but um really? yeah you're gonna be on the <laughs> gateway that is yeah. like when you hit mainstream <laughs> yep. that, that's a big deal i was talking to another artist about like the hierarchy of these platforms like and we agree super rare is at the top because that's like you know true art elitism right there and nifty gateway is kind of like all right we are trying to take this to the masses so we're getting big names here there and stuff that's um, true that's very true yeah but um wow i'm excited for you that's great. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous because I'm still working on it, but I hope <laughs> everything like um uh, really like turns out well. But like apart from Nifty, I am like obviously like looking forward to like collaborating, but like not with simply like visual artists. Like I want to start collaborating with like musicians and like poets, just to sort of like um introduce like other artists with different styles in um the crypto space i think that'll be very cool i think that is a brilliant idea um especially working with poets um that would be because no one's doing that right now some people are starting to have a lot of poet friends (laughs) really Yeah. yeah i think nfts can be a way of bringing back like art forms that have kind of died and withered off poetry is one of them i bought a piece from a guy who does claymation work and that has been completely eradicated and devalued and it is archaic but like there's so much work and um time put into it that to me like i think that's where the story is like how much of yourself again you put into it your art um I know it's left open to interpretation. Like, that's just part of it. Um, See no evil, I'm looking at right now. What was your idea behind that? Because there is, it's a black woman with a nose ring, um, but she's still got sunflowers over her hands. Um, And you've got the MLK quote from it too. What were you going for with this? Um, I think it was for, it was also inspired by the Black Lives Matter um, protests that were going on. And also, but it was not just, uh, that was the main inspiration, but also like it was just generally inspired by um, justice, you know, and uh, I, the message I really wanted to deliver with this piece was um, you can make such a huge change in the world if you're in a power to defend or protect someone. If you're in that power in that moment, you do that. And I feel like you could literally change someone's life forever. And I feel like a lot of the times, the the moments where you'll see someone go through something that's really unfair, and you could like stand up for them or you know, speak up for them, but you don't, you know, and I feel like those moments are so important. And I feel like those moments are what really make the world a better place to live in. 
just a little bit better to live in. So, but that was like the main message when it came to um, see no evil. Yeah. Eat Western might be my favorite um, because I don't know what it's going for, but it is awesome with the purple butterflies. And it looks like this little kid is eating a Barbie doll head. And it's, I, I just would love to hear the story behind this because it's awesome. Um, I think that one, uh, that one was about like um, how, how we've just been, how Africa has been like totally consumed by Western culture and how like us as little girls, like, well, it, it really stemmed from a conversation I had with my best friend a while ago. I don't know what sparked it, but her little sister didn't want a dark skinned Bobby doll, like a brown Bobby doll. She wanted a white one. Like she cried because her mom put her a brown skinned Bobby doll and she was just complaining about how ugly it looked and so forth. And that that really that really bothered me and it made me realize that um just simply getting your kid a Bobby doll that doesn't look like her sort of like sets the standard in her self-worth and how she sees herself and also just highlights the problem of Western culture and how um, the more European you look, um, the better you're treated. You know, pretty privilege is a problem. Colorism is a problem in Africa. You know, you simply will get the job because you're light-skinned. You know what I mean? Or you have a shorter nose, you have straighter hair, you have longer hair, you know what I mean? So that was that was what I was going with that one, like how we are taught so much of Western culture from such a young age without even mm-hmm. noticing it. Uh, I knew it was my favorite for a reason, and that was that's why. <laughs> um, no, that, I think that's perfect. Um, what you were going for, and I, yeah, that's all there for sure. It's yeah, um, beaming is totally different from the other ones why it's just a abstract um what what is that about um that one was about um i was okay the main thing i was doing there was like exploring with color and shapes and design elements and trying to see if i could make something look good with just using incorporating like design elements that or like all my design uh theory that I have and colors and so forth, but with a sunset theme to it because I love um, I love that sunset theme. Like I always like incorporated in my portraits, uh, side like red yellow highlights and so forth. And I wanted to do the same thing with um, these shapes. And once I was done, when I really looked at it, it reminded me of um, there's a song by Shade. And it's called Cherish the Day. That's what it reminded me of, like of how, um, I, I don't know why Sunday, but how like usually like on Sunday, you are, I, find, I always find myself in a very reflective state where I remind myself of like being more appreciative of like the simpler things in life, the day, the sunset, the warmth of the light, and that was that's that's what I felt from it when I was done. Yeah, I have a totally different view on Sundays. Like yours is much more <laughs> really beautiful and <laughs> um, comforting. Mine is filled with dread and uh, <laughs> just um, like almost like your freedom is being taken away from you and dying. Oh, I understand. Because I, yeah, but that might be like. The difference in culture uh, between here, where it's just work, 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 and yeah. the weekend is just time off. Otherwise, time off, basically. Yeah, yeah, which they would fill with work if there weren't laws for, against it. <laughs> you know, that's true. But I think also it's because Sundays for me, like I'm always at my grand. Well, I'm usually at my grandmother's house, mm-hmm. and I think that also really gives me, yeah, like I'm my most comfortable and sort of safest there Hmm. yeah oh that's again also something that's different with us because we also used to have big family dinners on sunday and i i don't like my family as much so that could (laughs) that's also (laughs) um uh 
Uh, you are <laughs> you're so uplifting and positive, and I'm just dragging you down to my level. <laughs> uh, um, do you have intentions of staying in South Africa, or do you ever see yourself again because you're going to be so popular now that you're on, you know, the mainstream platform? Um, everyone's going to be clamoring for your attention. Do you ever see yourself leaving, or do you want to stay there? Uh, no, I, I don't want to <laughs> sorry for laughing I'm just thinking about the state of our country right now <laughs> um, um, I don't want I don't want to leave let me put it this way I don't want to leave for good but I do want a better life for my kids like if you can look at the youth unemployment rate in South Africa just simply due to like corruption it's crazy. Like how is it, it's increased over the past two years? Like it's very scary because a lot of kids go to varsity, get their degrees, obviously are in debt because they need to pay off their fees, and then just sit at home for four or five years, no job, nothing, just corruption, all all the way through, just corruption and more corruption. So um, that that really scares me. That really scares me. Like our country is at its worst right now. We actually got. Um, when the pandemic started, we had funding. We got around about five hundred billion um, for uh, for like PPEs and like to get like masks and so forth to like get you know just to build better facilities so that we can sort of uh, handle this pandemic. And our country finished it. We finished it. No new <laughs> hospital facilities in sight. People are dying. Um, Doctors don't even have enough masks. You know what I mean? They don't have um, good equipment. So, like, those things are really, like, depressing. And they just, the corruption has just gotten out of hand. I, I, I can say that, you know. So, yeah, and I feel like, I feel the, hopefully, <laughs> the more money I make, I feel like the tax man is going to want to take majority of it. So, I need to get out of here. <laughs> but I'll definitely, like, this is still, like, my hometown, you know, like, I have a lot of memories here. My whole family's here. But I do want to explore the world and see what's out there. And hopefully there's something better. But mainly for my future children, like, really. Like, I want my kids to get to a space, a place where you don't have to be scared to tell me what you want to do if it's something in the the creative field like I want them to be able to explore with all kinds of things and you know be able to do them not say oh violin classes are expensive I know you you're interested in that but I won't be able to afford it you know what I mean those kinds of things so how did you avoid the corruption you said that it's such a prevalent thing you yeah. seem to have gotten out of it and you are well I don't think I've <laughs> well... gotten out of it not really. I think they just, they, how can I put this? They're dumb in terms of the fact that they don't think there isn't, they don't think there's money in the art field. They don't. They don't think so. So they're not looking there. Uh, but um, our finance minister has mentioned something along the lines of finding ways um, to tax people who use cryptocurrencies. So they are becoming aware of it. And they just are still trying to figure out how can they get a piece of the pie. But mm. right now, they, they, act, they literally don't know what's going on. They're just like, <laughs> okay, it's odd. Nothing's <laughs> happening there. So, yeah. Uh, okay. So, like, I was looking at it as um, kids get out of college and then they're forced to, like, just participate in the corruption that seems to be everywhere rather than... Yeah, uh, it depends on your, your career, but a lot of especially women succumb to it, hmm. you know? You get job offers from men who want to sleep with you. And some mm -hmm. people, some women are, like, very desperate because they breadwinners at home and, right. you know, because of circumstances, they end up, they end up doing it. Mm -hmm. But some people succumb, others don't, and they stay at home. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, it often sounds like the things that are happening there are similar to what happened here in the 60s and 70s, I imagine, for yeah. especially women. Like, oh, if you want this job, guess what? 
it's just uh, I can't believe and I guess this is that mindset that we were talking about before with people just want to be ignorant or just want to ignore problems other people yeah. face yeah. where we think especially here in the states we think we're in this post race society and mm -hmm. we're still facing issues it's like we've been sent back five decades mm -hmm. and now we have to go through it because our parents lied to us and said oh yeah everything's better and fixed yeah. you know and it's not at all and yeah. you guys are now in the same place we are we came back to where you guys were we were like oh yeah. you know this uh progress thing isn't working out for us too well we need to go back to where south africa is and <laughs> <laughs> that seems it's infuriating yeah. Um, yep. yeah i just hope that you know discussions like this i think are hopefully what changes and I do like talking to people that are more hopeful than myself because I get pretty pessimistic and yeah. um, so I am, I envy that, but I also know that that might be one of your coping mechanisms too. Cause it definitely of, is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you just like tell yourself, you know what, things are going to get better and that's how you get through it. I just, how, how I usually just get through it is I'm like, girl, draw. Hopefully, something will come along the way. I really, yeah, sometimes I, I don't even like, I don't, I don't even process that feeling. I don't know how I do it, but I do have certain things I'm just like, okay, I am deciding not to feel that, and I'm going to go. Um, so that's it. That's well, my coping. <laughs> well, you kind of are still feeling it and that's like why art therapy yeah. is a thing here in the states because that's how you're processing it um yeah. you are creating beautiful images of black women black children black men yeah because of you know the disgust that people show them and like you yep. said with um eat western it's yeah. that institutionalization of an idea that white skin's better and so yeah. yeah, you're not processing it in a traditional sense, but it's coming out in your art for sure. Definitely, definitely. But um, thank you so much for talking with me, and I also just having an honest conversation with me about race. I know it's not the easiest with strangers, um, but I appreciate it. Um, and I, honestly, I don't know how to thank you properly. Because I am. That's cool. Like I really also I really enjoyed this conversation. Like it was very uh, different from the kinds of conversations I usually am in, where it's like just main, mainly focused on my work. But I really loved like how it was. It also focused on um, me on a more personal level about like serious issues that are like going on in the world and they need to be talked about more they really need to be talked about more so i really appreciate it um i really appreciate this conversation yeah i'd like to thank my guests for taking the time to speak with me i'd also like to thank the dj aiden for allowing me to use his music and if you liked what you heard make sure to subscribe like and share it Thanks for listening.